so so to really kind of start off the story, if we uh, click a little bit. All right. So looking back to January 9th, 1992, this was 62 years after the discovery of Pluto. And what happened was the first confirmed discovery of planets outside of the solar system, which are known as exoplanets, made by Alex Wilson and Dale Frail. And they found a planet around a pulsar star. And really, if we fast forward to the next two decades, even though it's amazing to think that only the first exoplanet was found in the early 1990s, we really saw an explosion of exoplanet detections, with about 50 uh, discovered by the year 2000 and hundreds of planets discovered later. <coughs> and one thing that we're able to look at for these early exoplanet detections is that the majority of them, in fact, 85% of them were more massive uh, than Neptune in our own solar system. So this is a plot of planetary mass versus orbital period. So as you can see, a lot of these planets were larger than Neptune, which is a bit different than what we see in our own solar system. <coughs> and also we found a lot of these planets known as hot Jupiters, which are giant planets that are extremely close to their stars, which means they're extremely hot. So again, we're really seeing a lot of these planets that are totally different than what we see in the solar system. And for this reason, exoplanet hunting really does challenge theories of planet formation, evolution, and solar system dynamics because finding these kinds of planets really makes us question whether our solar system is kind of the rule uh, rather than the exception. And one thing you might notice about this plot is that early detections really didn't include any small planets. And the reason is because large planets are a lot easier to find than small planets. And all this changed with the Kepler mission. So the Kepler mission was NASA's very first mission specifically designed to find exoplanets and they were focused on potentially habitable Earth-sized planets. Now habitable means uh, different things to different people, but uh, just kind of a simple definition is that it has a temperature that might be able to support liquid water on its surface. So Kepler used what's known as the transit method of finding exoplanets. And the idea behind this is that as an object passes in front of a star, it blocks a portion of that star's light. And what you see here is a decrease in the brightness of a star if you're observing this star with a telescope. And if this happens periodically, let's say every 30 days, it's a really good chance that you found a planet orbiting the star with an orbital period of 30 days. So the time between each of these transits gives you uh, an estimate of the orbital period of the planet. And also the depth of this decrease of brightness gives you an estimate of the planet's <coughs> radius relative to the star's radius. And so far the transit method is the only known method of finding exoplanets that gives an estimate of a planet's radius. But the problem with finding really small planets uh, with the transit method is that a small planet barely changes the brightness of the star when it passes in front of it. In fact, this happens on orders of about 10 parts per million, which I'll uh, describe in a little bit. So Kepler was really one of the very first telescopes to actually be able to find these small planets. So what I want you to imagine is the Empire State Building. It's nighttime, um, all the lights are on and all the window shades are up. Somebody closes the shades of just one window by a few inches, and you need to be able to detect this change of brightness from 100 kilometers away. And now consider that a transit might happen for only a few hours, maybe once a day, once every week, once every month, maybe even once every year. So that kind of gives you some perspective about how difficult it is to find planets. So Kepler observed over 150,000 stars simultaneously for four years uh, between 2009 and 2013. The reason they chose such a large number of stars was because they really wanted to find another Earth out there and they had no idea, because we hadn't found any of these kinds of planets, how common they would actually be. And also the transit method depends on a very specific geometry of the orbit. You have to basically see a planet pass directly up along your line of sight in front of this planet, uh, in front of the star. So it was launched into an Earth trailing orbit in March 2009. And as you can see here, those blue panels are the solar panels which are continuously uh, pointed at uh, the sun so that it's always able to get solar power and it's able to rotate every 90 minutes, uh, sorry, every, every 90 days so that it's able to point at the same section of the sky um, to find all those planets at the same time. Unfortunately, it suffered instrumental failure in uh, 2013, which did end its mission. Nonetheless, it was extremely successful, which I'll show here. So this is a plot of the number of planets discovered just over the course of uh, of about 20 years. And so all the blue points are all the non-Kepler discovered planets. 
all the red ones, this is Kepler, um, they did pretty well in the early years, but just to give you an idea of some of the more recent discoveries, um, they are extremely successful in finding exoplanets. Um, and there have been several uh, detections, catalogs released that release about the same number of planets um, in more recent years. So again, I'll show you this plot here, which was of all the planets that we knew about that were non-Kepler planets. Um, after <coughs> Kepler really filled in a lot of that space. So as you can see here, there are a ton of new planets, um, especially importantly, a lot of them that are around Earth, Earth size or smaller. So now that we've reached today, um, so far we know of about 4,000 confirmed exoplanets and Kepler has discovered over half of those by itself. And it has about 2,000 unconfirmed candidates that are still waiting to be confirmed by follow-up observations. And thanks to Kepler mission, we now have an estimate for the total number of planets in the Milky Way to be about 100 billion. So on average, about one planet per star. And thanks to Kepler and other missions uh, that are going on even today, exoplanet science is really one of the fastest growing fields of astronomy. So that brings me to my search through Kepler data. So I was an undergraduate student and I'd actually just taken my first course on exoplanets. I really didn't know very much. I'd never had any research experience. And uh, the professor of this course, Jamie Matthews, um, I, I really wanted to take some, some research under him. So it started out with just an undergraduate uh, summer research position where I was tasked with looking through Kepler data to find anything that they might have missed. And I was able to find some new planets and this has really developed into basically my, piece, my PhD dissertation. So it's really taken me far. So I start out with uh, Kepler light curves, which are downloaded from MAST. This is just the Mikulski archives for, for space telescopes. And the first thing I have to do, obviously, before I look through the, uh, these light curves is to clean up the data. So there's several things I do. Um, the first thing is um, every time Kepler would rotate on, on its axis, that would uh, signify a single quarter of Kepler, of Kepler data. So over four years, there were 17 total quarters that I would have to stitch together into one complete light curve. And then I would also remove any data that was near gaps in this data, which I define as more than one day where there isn't any uh, brightness measurements. And the reason is because these kinds of data gaps usually coincide with areas where the flux might either increase or decrease a lot. And this can confuse the search for planets. And then I would flatten it using a detrending algorithm. So to give you an idea of what I mean by this, um, on the left-hand side, this is basically the whole light curve that I get from MAST. And on the right-hand side is the close-up. So as you can see, there's a lot of variability here. And this is really due to just natural stellar variability. But you can also see, especially in the second uh, plot on the right, that there are a few notches down every now and then. So that signifies the planet transit. Obviously, most of them are not going to be as easy to uh, pick out as that. But the idea behind detrending is we want to take out as much of that astrophysical noise as possible and not leave, uh, we, we want to be able to leave a planet transit as undistorted as possible. I'm not sure go, go, how to go back, but basically it totally flattens out the light curve and uh, it leaves, it, it basically takes out any, uh, any signals that have a time scale of greater than two days, which is much longer than the duration of a transit. So once I've cleaned up the light curve, finally it's able to be searched uh, with the pipeline that I've developed. So the first step is to use a box least squares algorithm, uh, which basically looks for any kind of signal that looks like a box shape, which is a very simple representation of a transit, but is also very efficient. And I would look for any of these signals that have orbital periods of anywhere from two days at a lower limit up to two years. So the lower limit was chosen because with this kind of work, the shorter and shorter periods you go, it becomes a, a lot more inefficient time-wise to actively searching for plan planets with periods this low. But also two years is an upper limit because that's half of the time scale that Kepler observed over. So this way you can be sure to find at least two transits of the planet. And then once I found a signal, I would completely remove it from light curve. And this, was, this would allow me to look through uh, this light curve a second time to find a second planet. And I would do this up to five times so that I would actually be able to find multi-planet systems. Um, if I actually found five good candidates, I could even search more if I wanted to. So just to give you an idea of what kind of information I'm able to get just from this um, box least squared bit, the first plot here is the power spectrum of the time series. 
and the highest peak in this gives you the best fit for the period of the planet. The second one is just the time, the time series light curve, um, and the red mark red marks out um, every single transit in this light curve. The third one is a phase diagram, where you basically take all the transits and you lay them on top of each other in order to improve the signal to noise ratio of your signal. And then the last one there is the same phase diagram, but zoomed in on the transit itself. So you can actually make a good kind of reality check to make sure that it does actually look like a planet transit. There's a lot of information that I'm able to tell just from uh, the results of this algorithm. For instance, the period of the candidate signal, the epoch, which is just the very first, um, the first, the time of the first transit in the system, and the signal to noise ratio. So one, a uh, few things I can ask myself to just this really first checks to see if this is actually a good candidate. Um, are there at least two transits in the light curve? So this is the threshold that I used. Uh, Kepler did use three transits um, as their as their threshold, mainly because uh, the lower and lower transits you go, the lower the signal noise ratio, and the higher chance that it isn't actually a planet. But this is consistent with, with what some other independent planet search um, people have done. For instance, planet hunters have even looked for planets with only a single transit. Also, you can ask yourself, does it look like the only significant event in the phase diagram? So the reason is because you want a transit to be really strong, uh, a good signal compared to the noise, and it should be the only unique uh, event in the light curve. Also, um, I use the threshold for signal to noise ratio of six or greater to be just to kind of give it a, a, a first pass through as a good candidate, whereas the Kepler team used uh, 7.1. So this is what I kind of mean by digging deeper into the noise um, of Kepler light curves, because this is a lower signal to noise ratio than what they used. And as a result, <coughs> you are going to get a lot more false alarms um, in this data due to noise. But I have candidacy tests that ideally are able to filter out a lot of these bad signals. And also ask myself, does it look like a planet transit? Planet transits typically look like a U shape. Um, and there's other, other things you can ask yourself. For instance, is it asymmetrical? Um, a planet transit should be very symmetrical. And to give you an idea of what I mean by weak signals that I'm looking for that uh, the Kepler mission would have passed over, this is kind of that transit I showed you before. It has a really nice signal noise ratio of over 200. This is one of my new candidates. So this one has a signal noise ratio of only 6.3. And you might ask yourself, that doesn't really look like transit. Well, if you were to um, actually bin all that data into 30 minute bins, that's the black points here, and the red line is the best fit uh, model to, to this transit data, you can actually see there is a, a dip in the middle there. So whether or not this is a, a good candidate, a planet candidate is still something that we need to figure out though. So after searching through transits, that gives me a good list of candidate transit signals. But of course, there's a lot of different things that are planets that can make it look like it was actually a planet, but are not. So these are known as false positives. So I have to go through a lot of tests to make sure that my planet candidates aren't actually just due to instrumental or stellar noise, and also not just astrophysical phenomena such as eclipsing binary stars. So there's a lot of tests I run, especially against instrumental and stellar noise false positives because I'm looking at such low sub noise ratio candidates. The first one, I just fit a transit, uh, a transit model to the light curve and then I fit a straight line and it should fit the transit model better than a straight line. And also uh, the uniqueness test is kind of what I've mentioned earlier where you look at the phase diagram and make sure that it is much more significant than any other potential events in this uh, phase diagram. The single event test um, tests if a single transit is dominating the signal to noise ratio. So this happens a lot um, for candidates that have quite long over the periods. You might have uh, one transit that is way larger in signal to noise ratio than the rest. So this kind of indicates that it's not a consistent transit and therefore probably not a good planet. And also uh, just I have a test that is able to compare the right and the left side of the transit to make sure that it is indeed symmetric. And there's a lot more, but those are the main ones. And in terms of astrophysical false positives, um, I do look for a significant secondary um, in the event. And the reason is because if it's not a planet that's passing in front of your star, but actually another star, that star is contributing brightness to the system when Kepler's uh, using its telescope to measure the brightness. So when the star passes in front of the target star, it does block a portion of that light, but when it passes behind your target star, that will also lead to a total decrease 
um, in the brightness of the system. So typically you'll see one very obvious deep event, but also a second still very obvious, but not as deep event. So this is an indication of a secondary eclipse. The odd even test um, kind of does something similar, but this is just for the case where you might have that really deep event and the less deep event actually lined up on top of each other if they happen at exactly half of the orbital period um, of your signal. And also, um, as I mentioned before, transits are typically U-shaped, whereas uh, those caused by an eclipsing binary star are typically V-shaped. So if you find a transit that looks like a V-shape, it's probably not a planet. So one thing that's on my to-do list um, is that all of these tests are only against eclipsing binary false positives, but there's other astrophysical phenomena. So for instance, if there's a background star that was caught in the same pixel um, as your target star, there could be a transit around that star, and that's what uh, the Kepler telescope is picking up. So after all of this, finally I have a good list of planet candidates, and typically follow-up research is going to be required in order to actually confirm a candidate as a bona fide planet. So just some early results to make sure that my Kepler pipeline is actually working. Um, compared to the most recent Kepler pipeline, I was able to find almost 100% of their confirmed planets. I missed two of them. And out of their candidate planets, the ones that haven't been confirmed yet, I was able to find 91% of them. So I feel pretty confident that my pipeline is working. And then on top of all these rediscoveries, I also have actually over 100 new planet candidates that have not announced yet, but are in the works. Now some of those have been announced. Um, these were um, four of them that I discovered when I was an undergrad doing that summer research position. Um, one of them is actually one of the very smallest planets ever to be found in Kepler data. Um, it's around Mercury size and it has a confirmed planet in the same system already. So the fact that it has a confirmed planet is a really good indication that this kind of sig signal is not caused by a star for instance. Uh, there's also uh, KY408.05. So this one is about five times the size of Earth, but it has one of the longest orbital periods of any planet in Kepler data, uh, with an orbital period of about 637 days. This one's also really exciting um, because there are really not that many Kepler planets um, that have this large of an orbital period. And I call it a, a warm Neptune because uh, based off of a few simple calculations, it actually has an equilibrium temperature that's quite similar to Earth's. Now, of course, because it's so large, it's probably not going to be a rocky planet like the Earth, and thus not a very promising candidate for uh, follow-up research for habitability. But it might have a moon, um, in which case that moon might actually have a good temperature, and I think this one will be interesting to look up more. Um, in terms of the more recent ones that I've been doing over my PhD, this one is a particularly exciting find because it is roughly the size of Earth, and it receives only two times uh, the amount of flux from its star as our own Earth does. So um, it's also around a G-type star, and most of the planets that we found that are potentially habitable have been around um, smaller stars like M-type stars. Um, so far, there have been robo-AO observations done of this uh, of the star, and there has been no other uh, stellar companion in the system discovered. So that's a really good indication that this is not due, uh, this is not an astrophysical false positive. Another interesting one is uh, this one. So it has an orbital period of 848 days. So this one only had two transits. So this means that it, it was one that wouldn't have been able to be found uh, by the Kepler team because they require at least three transits. So obviously I'll be looking into this one more, but if it does indeed become a, a good candidate, um, this will have the 10th longest orbital period planet ever to be found in Kepler data. Now, one thing you might wonder about is um, the completeness of my pipeline. Is It's basically how good is it at finding uh, known planets? Um, so you can simulate uh, planet transits and find how many the pipeline detects and correctly passes as a planet candidate. Ideally, you want to be able to find as many planets in the data as possible. And by simulating planets, you'd be able to get a good idea of this. So out of 146,000 uh, planets that were simulated, Kepler has released um, the same um, simulated data, so I was able to test compared to mine. So they found 31% of those. I was able to only find about 27%, but that's pretty close. So I'm, I'm happy with it. And of those detected planets that were correctly passed as a planet, um, they passed 85% of theirs, and I passed uh, a little bit higher, 85.4%. So obviously, if 
you can have uh, different tests that are super easy to pass, and that will pass a lot of these detected planets, detected candidates as planets. But that will kind of you have to balance it because that will also <clears throat> mean that bad planet candidates are going to be passed as planets. So you can also look at the reliability of your pipeline by simulating false positives and then seeing how many of your pipeline correctly passes as a false positive or incorrectly passes as a planet candidate. So in this area, I'm actually so far doing better than the Kepler team, which is exciting. <laughs> um, so far, I've only tested my pipeline against instrumental and stellar noise. I haven't been able to put together um, these kinds of numbers for testing against astrophysical false positives like eclipse and binaries, but this is something that I plan to do. So um, just some upcoming work um, now that I'm two years into my PhD and I have several years to go um, before I finish up. The first thing um, I want to do is to explore all of these new planet candidates in more depth. Um, typically, this will involve doing follow-up research, for instance, seeing if there is actually another uh, star in the same system, um, and also to establish the accuracy of planet uh, radius measurements. Um, if I'm looking for planet candidates that I want to be around Earth size, it's really important that they're actually Earth size, and there's different things that can actually affect um, the measurement of the planet radius. And this is where Gemini is going to be sending in, so that's what Henry will be talking to you about. Um, and then once I have kind of my new final candidate list, I can use that final planet catalog, uh, candidate catalog, combine it with my completeness and reliability measurements, and then uh, do occurrence rate statistics. So this will, I'll be able to tell, for instance, how common Neptune-sized planets are around G-type stars. Or one that's particularly interesting is the eta Earth value, which is the fraction of stars with at least one potentially habitable Earth-like exoplanet. And so far, there's actually no consensus in the astronomical community. Um, recent values have ranged anywhere from 2% of all stars to 22% of all stars have a planet like this. So any new uh, estimate of this value is going to be really valuable. And lastly, I can apply the pipeline that I've developed to other transiting exoplanet missions. In particular, there's K2, which is uh, the follow-up mission to Kepler because even though the reaction wheel um, made it not able to point to the same section of the sky, the telescope itself was still in working order. Unfortunately, I've heard that it's very low on fuel right now, so that might end, but still K2 has had a lot of data that I haven't looked at yet. And also TESS, which some of you I'm sure are aware of. Uh, this launched as recently as April 2018, and by January I hope to be able to get a hold of that data and hopefully be one of the first people to find planets in TESS data. That's a part of the public. Thank you. Questions for everybody? Yeah, questions. Zoom land. Uh, I was wondering, so if I understand correctly, one of the differences between the Kepler Papa and your Papa is that you adopt a signal to noise of six and they adopt a signal to noise of 7.1. Mm -hmm. What is the motivation behind those values? Why did they choose seven and you choose six? So, this is a question that I asked. Um, one of my collaborators who was on the original Kepler team. They do have a paper from 2002 describing that value, but he <coughs> kind of said it, it seemed kind of arbitrary. It was just that the lower you go, the more false alarms you're going to get that are due to noise. And if you're looking at 200,000 stars, you want, you know, it's, it's going to take way too much time to go through them. So it seemed that um, this was a value that I, I can't remember the specific numbers, but gave would give you know, one false alarm out of X number of stars. So the reason I chose to do it lower was because my original um, search was only, was, was focused only on the list of stars that they'd already found a planet around, and those will have a higher chance of giving more planet candidates. So I wasn't, I wasn't um, kind of tied down by searching through all 200,000 stars, so I didn't have that same time constraint. Mm -hmm. Can I also ask a question? Can you go back to the table where also you compile the result with the Kepler team? Sure. Like it's different. I might need to use the arrow keys. <laughs> I just want a little bit more explanation and um, about uh, like your success rate compared to the Kepler team sure. success rate. Because similarly to me, if you go to like 
you go to say and constraining from uh, three transit to two and then go to lower signal noise ratio right like your false positive rate sounds like to me it will be higher but somehow yeah. like in your case it seems to be lower like you have some so it, um the, it's difficult to make a direct comparison because all of my tests some of them are the same as kepler's but i've i've done some of my own tests and we also use different metrics um at which you, like at which point a planet candidate will either pass or fail so it could be the case that for all of my tests for the um, false positives due to instrumental noise, mine are harder to pass. So that means that the number of, of bad candidates that are due to noise that do pass is, is going to be lower. Um, one thing to mention though, is that I did find less planet candidates than theirs. So because I'm optimizing around maximizing the number of candidates that I found that did pass and minimizing the number of, of false positives um, to, to pass, it could be that the, the that I because I did find less planet candidates than they did, they happen to be better ones or easier to pass um, the tests. So that makes it easier for me to to optimize the metrics, but I would have lower overall completeness than Kepler. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yes. It's related to that, um, I like that you compared your success rate to Kepler pipeline and that it obviously matches you know, extremely well. Did you look at um, Kepler's own false positives? Like did you run those through your pipeline and see if you pick up yeah. any? So basically for instrumental noise it's hard to simulate in exactly what these kinds of uh, false positives will be. So they basically made four different data sets. The first one was they took a light curve and they inverted all the values. So that any value that you find in that, if it's going to be a negative increase, it's actually a positive increase in the light curve itself. So you know that's not a planet transit. Um, so hopefully this would be able to simulate kind of natural variability in the light curve while getting rid of any possibility of finding a good planet candidate. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, but what I was sort of trying to get at was, um, was any previously identified Kepler candidates, so you know, uh, real candidates that later follow-up show we're not actual planets. Have you looked at that population to oh. run through your pipeline to see if you pick up any that have been shown not to be, or well, shown to be mm -hmm. false positives? So I've compared kind of, I've got my own list of the Kepler planet candidates and confirmed planets that I found and that I've passed. Some of the planet candidates that Kepler found, I actually did not pass. And um, I haven't taken a look at which ones I have passed that they haven't passed. One thing is that some of the ones that haven't passed did so because of follow-up research, which I haven't had access to, or I'm not aware of. For instance, I'm not sure if a candidate failed their tests um, strictly due to their own candidacy tests, or if it's because of a later follow-up research that, that actually found the eclipsing binary in this system. So it, um, a lot of the well, basically they ran uh, what's known as the RoboVetter on all of the planet candidates and they gave each planet candidate a score um, from zero to one, where a higher score, um, like 1.0, is a really good chance that it's a planet candidate and a very low score is a good chance that it's a false positive. And there's actually a lot of um, planet candidates that have like a 0 0.3 or 0 0.2 value um, that haven't been considered false positives and those are typically the ones that I automatically just mark um, as false positives. And on the other side, there are some actually very high disposition score values that eventually became false positives because of follow-up research. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so about this table, why, if we go to <laughs> Kepler and you, why is the detection efficiency so low, generally? Oh, you mean for the percent of detected planets? Yeah. Marked as candidates? No, no, the, the first row. Just um, out of all the detect simulated planets. Right. So the simulated planets, um, they made bas basically, they wanted to get a good range of planets from, I think, w one day or around there up to 500 days. And also a Sigmund's Roy's ratio from, you know, below what either of us would even consider mm -hmm. a, a good planet candidate. So, um, the reason why the detection efficiency is low is not necessarily that our um, that our pipelines aren't good at finding planets greater than sigma noise ratio six or seven. It's just that some of those simulated planets might actually 
um, like uh, they wanted it to make they wanted to make it really hard <coughs> to be able to detect a lot of these in order to test how your pipeline does with low signal noise ratio planets. Right. So they had a lot more low signal noise ratio planets than you know 500 signal noise ratio planets. Okay, so it's a it's a property of the of the simulated data. Exactly. Not of the pipeline. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So do you know what's the correct answer for your for your signal to noise and everything, if is that the right value that well you would for me six was just again chosen arbitrarily. It was like it's a little bit lower. Um, I think that is something that I want to um, do like follow up on. Like if I were to go down to five, for instance, how many more planet candidates would I be getting versus how many more false positives would I be getting? And at what point is it just no longer time efficient to be lowering the signal to noise ratio? So that's something that I've thought about. Um, I don't have a, a final answer about what is a, you know, the best value. I think it, it really is kind of a balance between how much time you're willing to spend looking through all of these false alarms um, versus making sure that you actually are still getting a lot of good can candidates out of this uh, lower signal noise ratio reading. Not anybody from Zoom? If not, we can switch over to. So, let's go to stop sharing. Stop share and re share. Don't have as many fancy pictures as I show. Us. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, thank you for inviting me to this. Something weird on the screen. Can you, can you advance and see if it. Mm. Okay. Are we not pushing the presentation out anymore or something? But it's only on one screen. Yeah why, yeah, why is it not? I, mean, I don't think it will be a huge deal. Okay. I'll have to look on this side. For a <laughs> too, so. Okay, so uh, thank you again for inviting us here uh, to talk about research. Uh, so in this half of this uh, team talk, I'll be starting to talk a little bit about uh, what, uh, how the Gemini program that we're here to observe for Maxim Michelle's research, and then in general, uh, kind of my own research in terms of how stellar companions influence uh, planet formation and migration and the histories of, of, of planet. Right? So here's a little background about this project. So I was also an undergrad at UBC where Michelle was a grad student. Uh, so all the time growing up in Vancouver, uh, NLC Hertzberg used to be HIA, which is what probably most of you know our institution has. But right after I got there as a postdoc, they decided to rebrand themselves as Hertzberg Astronomy and Astrophysics Research Center. So now we're Hawk, I guess, H A A R C. Uh, but uh, we, I think H I A is still very commonly used. It's still our email list, it's still H I A, and, um, and generally we are NSC Hertzberg.
Uh, hey guys, we can't hear. I, I, oh. I don't know. Oh, thank you. Jeez. Okay. Has, have you not been able to hear the whole talk? Uh, we heard uh, we heard Michelle's talk, but none of Henry's. But we've been making our own interpretive narration from the slides. <laughs> Okay, well, okay. I'm, I'm thanks, Lauren, for letting us know. I, when I restarted it, it must have done that. Okay. Hi, Lauren. I didn't realize. You yeah, Lauren's been listening in this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can't go backwards. Anyway, we'll pretend we're back on our last slide. <laughs> Looking at the, the middle section, we know that uh, stellar companions are common. So, Vega 2010 did a survey of both. 450 solar type stars, and uh, they found that basically 44% of them were in multiple system, two or even more higher stars. So we know that binary stars of higher order multiples are common. Uh, Michelle pointed out, and here's another part showing this kind of similar idea, but planetary systems are also common, like basically one in, uh, one in, one, one, there's one plan for almost every star in the Milky Way. So stars are common, planets are common, so we really we want to really answer the question is how do these stellar friends like these companion stars influence planetary systems? This is a, I think it's an important question to answer because uh, w when you look at up there, there's going to be many many systems of planets with companion stars. Okay, so if you look at the nebular theory of planet formation, uh, you know you start with a big uh, gas cloud, it collapses uh, down, and then due to angular momentum conservation, pushes materials out into a spinning disk. Uh, eventually, planets somehow form from this. We don't really exactly know how. Uh, they basically <clears throat> open up gaps in the disk, uh, these planets coalesce and cool down, and then you end up with an evolved uh, planet system that might look like our solar system. So if you look at this whole step, you can kind of think broadly there's two ways where companion star can come in and mess everything up or help things along. Okay, there's the disk effect, so the companion star may influence the disk in which planets form, uh, as well as later on in, through multi-body dynamics, so the companion star may into it, interact with gravitationally with the plants after the plants are formed and, ch and change uh, the way things look. So we're looking, thinking about this first. Uh, so this is a part from Adam Krause's book. And Trent said that Adam Krause gave a talk here recently. They say, uh, maybe you heard about this too. Uh, but he surveyed the Taurus Auriga star forming region, which is about a couple of million years old. So these are young. They expected to still have their disk. Uh, and he looked at uh, how often he could find infrared excess, which would correspond to having a, a protoplanetary disk. Uh, as a function of binary separation and also comparing it to a group of single stars that have no binary companion. And you look at this plot, uh, but this is the main, the main conclusion of this paper is that when you have a binary star within 40 AU, closer than 40 AU, you, you see that uh, they're much less likely to have this. Right? So one, thing, one conclusion you can draw from this is that uh, a companion star closer than 40 AU to the host star will truncate the disk or do something to reduce the disk lifetime, uh, which also will have not good consequences for planet formation. Uh, and then, so in 2016, Adam did another uh, paper uh, where they looked at the companion star separation of Kepler host stars and, the, and compared to the few stars from Vega 1 that are 2010. So now we're looking at only binary systems and we're plotting the histogram of the projected separation of binary stars um, uh, in red for the Kepler host stars and in blue for the Vega Bond uh, uh, solar type field stars. Right? So if the Kepler planet hosting stars are the same as the field star, the red lines and blue lines should overlap. But since uh, the red lines, so these are the ones with planets, or there's a deficiency uh, of number of stars with hosts and companions compared to field stars which don't not host close planets. Uh, the conclusion that they drew from this work is that when there's a binary star, binary star within 50 AU, uh, you end up being three times less likely to host a planet uh, compared to having a more wider separation. So this kind of story, these two, these two stories are kind of consistent with each other. Right? They're saying that when you have a close-in binary, you mess up the disk, you, you reduce the material available to form planets. And then when you look at these evolved Kepler stars, you actually do see, in fact, there is fewer planets when you have coastal environments. Uh, so some of the work I did as a graduate student uh, is to look at multi-body effects with a, using a hot, hot Jupiter as a, as a case study. So uh, Michelle did talk about hot Jupiter a bit, but basically the gas giant planets on orbital periods of only a few days. 
uh, so very, very close and 10 times closer than like say Mercury in our solar system. And something interesting is that for the systems of hot Jupiter as well as a spin orbit alignment measurement, uh, one third, third of them are misaligned. So that is, we look at the normal vector of the, of the, of the orbits, angular momentum vector. So it would point this way and look at the spin vector of the star, uh, there, there, there's a, there's a <clears throat> misalignment. There's a, they don't line up with each other. So then one question you can ask is whether or not the, the companion stars are actually cause, causing both migration to, get, to form these super close in planets as well as the misalignment. And so the survey we did uh, was on Keck using Note 2, so a very similar instrument to NERI. We look at about 80 solar type stars and we look at systems that are already known to host transiting hot Jupiter. In our group, uh, we look at we look for, plan for planetary companions as well as stellar companions. So this is a project led by my PhD advisor, Heather Knudsen, uh, and also her team of graduate students, including me, as well as Daniel Fischkors and Marta Bryan. And together we did the, we call it the Friends of Hot Jupiter's program. Uh, so we wrote a bunch of papers about planetary and stellar companions. And the main result from, from my part of the work doing the imaging for stellar companions is to answer these questions. So first, can stellar companions be responsible for both hot Jupiter migration and misalignment. So one way we can do this is uh, we had a sample, uh, a smaller sample that split up into an almost equal set of misaligned comp set companion, so misaligned planets and a control group of well-aligned planets. And the question we want to answer is if it is indeed true that the stellar companion is causing this misalignment, which then in turn causes uh, migration through something called like cosine beta oscillation, uh, we expect to see a much larger companion fraction for the misaligned case compared to the control case. So well, we did a study and we checked, uh, the, we measured the, the companion frequency. So we found that 48% of the misaligned planets had a companion and 51% of the control planets had a companion after we correct for survey sensitivity. So from this, we really say that companions are not correlated with planet misalignment. There's something else going on uh, with this mis misalignment, not due to companion store. So then the other question is, uh, like I mentioned, uh, the theory is that uh, maybe cosine beta oscillations due to the initial misalignment between the orbital plane of the planet and the companion binary star causes things to migrate inwards. Uh, so we can actually calculate whether these companions, stellar companions that we did find are actually capable of causing cosine beta oscillations. Right? So they have to be close enough and big enough in order to do this. And we found that actually only one in five, we would take the most optimistic case where everything is misaligned as much as possible so that the strength of the oscillations are, is as large as possible. Uh, we found only 20% of hot Jupiter's can really be explained by this mechanism. So there's something else going on in the formation of hot Jupiter's. So then another, with this data set, we can also ask another question. Is there a correlation between the presence of a stellar companion and, and the presence of hot Jupiter or hot Jupiter formation? Uh, so from this, we, we, we can look at the, <clears throat> How, how often systems are found with companions uh, as a function of how far away the companions are. So uh, not, not directly from my work, but from our from the hot Jupiter survey, we were able to be sensitive to stars within one to 50 AU of the hot Jupiter uh, host star. And we found that 4% of stars with hot Jupiter have a companion star within one to 50 AU. And 16% of stars without planets for regular one and dark 2010 have a companion star at the same separation. Okay, so, this suggests to us, this is similar to what Adam Krauss found in 2012 and 2016, that when there's a companion within 50 AU, there seems to be less giant planets. So Krauss found this in 2016 for uh, capital planets in general, but we're, here we're focusing on giant planets. On the other hand, when we're looking at the imaging survey, we can, we're now sensitive to companions between 50 and 2000 AU. And here now we find that 47% of stars with hot Jupiter have a stellar companion. Uh, and again, 16% of stars uh, from Vega Bonnet 2010 have a stellar companion between 50 and 2,000 AU. Okay, so 44% of stars have some kind of companion, but we're only looking for this separation from 50 to 2,000, or even 50 to infinity, it's above 16 to 20%. So there's a significant difference between uh, stars with hot Jupiters and stars without uh, planets in terms of companion fraction. So maybe we can think that this, this could be a hint that wide companions, so beyond 50 AU, do the opposite, uh, they actually maybe somehow enhance the rate of forming giant planets. So how could this happen? Right? So one potential uh, idea for this to happen is that maybe the protoplanetary disks in these binary star systems are just more massive. So when you have a companion star, there's more mass in the disk, 
and this could make it more likely to form a giant planet. So this is a, a an idea we had uh, as a grad student, but I had as a grad student, and so let, this past summer we, we were able to just start to test this out. So uh, at NRC Hospital, we also have Nika Vandermolen. I think she used to be a postdoc at IRFA, uh, and then she moved. Uh, so now we're collaborators, and we hired a summer student, Nat Como from University of Victoria, to work with us last summer to actually answer this question. So uh, hopefully there'll be some results from that soon. Um, yeah. <clears throat> The other way that stellar companions could influence planet formation is that uh, the companion star could actually shape the disk itself. Right? So this is a simulation from Ruben Dong's work on a system that's known to have asymmetry in the disk from Hubble imaging back in the 90s. And he showed that uh, well, this is a solar type star host with an M star companion, so a very similar architecture to a Heinz of our Jupiter system. This separation is about 100 AU, so this is a wide companion. And in his modeling, he showed that uh, the gravitational forces from the, the companion star could cause the same asymmetries in the disk as observed in the imaging. So, the, uh, so although maybe the star doesn't mean there's more mass in the in the protoplanetary disk, it could create some regions where there's higher density, making it more likely, to, making them more likely sites for planet formation. So, these are two potential ways where companion star could actually enhance giant planet formation. Uh, there's other effects that I won't talk about too much, but uh, you know we know that companion star could also talk or warp planet for planetary disk. Right? So this doesn't necessarily enhance planet formation, but having a warp or torque disk could uh, could then cause a planet to form in the torque disk, which means that the planet is then misaligned. So this could be a way of getting misalignment without direct cosi, for example. Uh, and then some other people <clears throat> that saw a result. They wrote an idea that's not testable, which is like a perfect theory paper, right? Uh, <laughs> where you have a companion star that can excite cosine beta oscillation on a more distant unseen planet about 40 AU. So we're not people, we're not currently possible, not currently possible for us to detect giant planets this far away yet through radio velocity. But then that can excite uh, uh, cosine beta on an inner planet of about five or ten AU, and then that causes that inner planet to migrate inwards and become a hot Jupiter. So maybe in about two decades, we, or maybe with better guy astrometry, we can actually uh, test this last theory. Uh, so in some way, the influence of friends on planets ranges, uh, it, it, there's influence of our steps from detection to uh, formation of, uh, of the disk and then formation of planetary systems themselves. Right? As we saw, uh, they can cause false positive or cause a radius underestimate in transiting planets. Uh, at the disk stage, you could truncate and reduce this lifetime. They could redistribute materials in disk, which might help enhance planet formation. And in planetary systems, uh, our work showed that they're unlikely to cause star planet codes at uh, We did find that Y companions were correlated with giant planets, and we're working on trying to explain that right now. Uh, and uh, other people like Adam Krauss found that post in companions were anti correlated with planets. So I think I'll just do one last play. I can't go back to this, unfortunately. but. Uh, Something else I'm also working on uh, that I'll be happy to talk about too uh, in any meetings is that I'm also working on an M star imaging survey to try to directly image planets around M star. So there's not really companion stars anymore, although, as you see here, this compan companion candidate, so this is the host star here behind the coronavirus that's masked out, uh, is likely a brown dwarf companion. So we're, we're still most, we're more likely to find brown dwarfs than actual giant planets around these M stars, uh, but this, we have almost 200 stars looking at using the vortex chronograph on Node 2. And the main survey is finished, uh, and we are following up on about 40 candidates uh, in the next year or so. So I think I'll stop there and take questions. There was, um, at the Gemini Science meeting, there was talks from the uh, DISI and the Alapake, um team and they sort of make it sound like this anti-correlation with between planets and close and companions is controversial what do you think about that okay uh i actually haven't uh okay. seen i haven't read the most recent papers i guess it, uh, so I, I don't i don't do you remember what the main reason for um i'm not exactly sure i mean i think it's got to be something in small number of statistics i mean some some sort of statistical i'm not exactly sure why they why they say that they find just as many um, binaries as they should, but okay, yeah. we can talk about it later. Sure, I just wasn't sure if you were. Yes. 
I have a question, Henry. Yeah, hi, Lauren. Hey, very nice talk. Um, I enjoyed learning about your work. Again, it's, it becomes clearer to me every time I hear you speak about it. Um, so one question I have about, I'm not sure how much you can speak to this. This is about the Krauss et al. 2016 result that the close-in companions are anti-correlated with planets. Um, I have sort of a favorite anecdotal system that bucks the trend, which is KOI 3158, also known as Kepler 444. This is a very nearby K dwarf star with um, five planets, all uh, Mars sized, and a stellar companion, an M dwarf binary orbiting the K dwarf primary. Um, and sweeping within something like 5 AU of the system of small planets. The reason I bring this particular system up is this was an unusually nearby star and unusually bright, which I guess allowed the, well, both the detection of the companion and also the detection of the planets themselves. For most Kepler stars, we are not sensitive to Mars-sized planets. So I wonder, um, if you can comment on whether it's it's really that there's an anti-correlation between uh, companions and planets, or could it be that companions reduce the sizes of planets through the kind of disk truncating that you were describing? Right, yeah, so, uh, so that could be the case. So another paper that I didn't mention is by Ji Wang. Uh, so he did something very similar to uh, Krauss's work, but uh, I think Klaus uses the non-redundant aperture mass on, on Note 2, and G uh, used a chronograph and laser in, uh, guide star. But so G's work showed that there's a, the, 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 the anti-correlation actually depends on planetary mass. So just like you said, uh, he, he found that, uh, <clears throat> I forgot exactly how, how the, co like, the correlation goes, but he did find that uh, is not absolutely true for every type of planet. It does depend on how big the planet is, whether or not a stellar companion will make a difference. Uh, and I guess I should be a little bit more clear. I think I was a little sloppy when I say that uh, planets are anti-correlated with binary stars in the Kepler case. It's more like uh, planets are, are less likely to exist, or it's less likely to find <clears throat> a star with a planet uh, that's also in a binary star system when you're within 50 AU. So, so I think the, the number that the statistically significant number that Krauss quoted was three times less likely. So it's not impossible. So it's, uh, systems like Kepler 444 still can exist, but they're just less likely to do so. Uh, but again, Kepler 444 is also an oddity, so it might be an exception to the rule in that case. Yeah, sorry, I don't have a more satisfying answer. <laughs> Thank you. Else, All right, let's thank both of our speakers again.